thank you for coming to the Yukon Island Homestead Museum. My name is Angie Grove. I'm the executive director here. And I'm really excited for tonight's, well, today, this afternoon. I can't remember what time of day it is. <laughs> really excited for this afternoon's talk. Um, before we get into the talk, I want to just briefly say a few words about the institution that you're in. Um, we're a community nonprofit run mostly by volunteers. Um, in fact, we have one, two, three, three volunteers in the room right now. Thank you to our amazing volunteers uh, for everything they do here. Um, we help us with the artifact collection. Um, our volunteers run the lecture program, our book club, our field trips, all the reenactment events that we redo, and living history um, events as well. So check out our website to learn more about some of those things. Um, but the program we're here today for is our monthly lecture series. And I was given a, a little history lesson by uh, Phyllis, actually, um, who will be up here at the podium. Um, I was given a little history lesson by Phyllis about this monthly lecture series. Um, it is in its what, like 17th year or something like that um, of having a lecture by different guest speakers every month um, of the year, except for usually December. Although, uh, special announcement, this year we are hosting a December lecture on the first Sunday of the month for members and volunteers in the museum only. Um, and you can purchase membership at the front desk. It's really quick, just fill out a form. Um, actually, and I'm going to be giving that talk. It's going to be called Ethan Allen, Infernal Villain. So if you're interested in coming to that, um, that will be our members kind of give, end of your gift um, as a special talk is for them. So, but uh, the talks here, Phyllis was telling me, started around the year 2007. Um, this was at a time when the original museum organization um, had uh, kind of collapsed and wasn't running the full museum at that time. <coughs> and a group of volunteers and uh, tour guides for that former museum got together monthly and um, it rotated, like, vo like volunteers were basically giving the talks and just sharing history and stories and information. Um, so it was kind of, this is really a grassroots program that started by the volunteers for the volunteers and has since grown and now we have guest speakers from all over the world. Sometimes they just zoom in onto the TV screen with us um, and sometimes we're lucky enough to have them in person. Um, and we have uh, local speakers as well, like today's speaker too. Uh, so before um, I step away, I'm just going to introduce um, Phyllis and then she's going to introduce the speaker. Phyllis is our current treasurer of the Ethan Allen Homestead Museum and also our past president. So a wealth of knowledge um, and has been a volunteer here at the museum since 2007 when those lecture series started. Um, so I think she also has the, the senior cap for the most <laughs> veteran volunteer for all of us. I'm not yeah. sure. I think John was here a little before I was, maybe a month or two. A little bit. A little bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> so she's junior. So she, what's the second, not valedictorian? The salutatorian. <laughs> okay, see, Phyllis and I have been here a lot longer than Ethan Allen was. So. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, so true. <laughs> okay. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Phyllis, who will be introducing our speaker today. Yay, Phyllis. Thank you. 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 Thank you, Angie. Yes, I spent a lot of time in this place and seen a lot of changes so for the last few years. A lot of them for the better, and so we have grown oh, quite a bit from the, from the time when I started. So, welcome everybody. So glad you came to hear Angela today, one of our very own people here, <laughs> who has been with us for a while too. Uh, she's a native Vermonter, as we say, and she grew up in Essex Junction and still lives in Essex Junction, even though it's changed from a village to a city. <laughs> oh, well. Uh, married and has two wonderful grown children, a son, Stephen, and his wife, Amanda, and a daughter, Allison, and her husband, Scott. So they, of course, are, have left the nest. But her nest is not completely empty because she has a kitty child named Billy, who's her writing companion, too. So uh, she's been 
writing fiction since the early days of school, always scratching out ideas for stories rather than doing her homework, as she says, especially math. <laughs> uh, her first completed novel, No Safe Haven, was published in 2016, which I read about that same time. <laughs> and her second, The Bells of o Oyster Bay, published last year, 2022. So she's moving up in the world of writing. Uh, right now she's hard at work on a contemporary series, but is working on an idea for historical fiction, fiction, yes, not fiction, fiction, <laughs> that will reflect today's political as atmosphere. Sorry, my vocal cords are receding, they tell me, because I'm getting old. Yes, they're shrinking, so that's why I croak a lot, but, so you'll have to excuse that. But anyway, let's welcome our wonderful own Angela. <laughs> Well, knowing it's a small group makes me feel a lot more comfortable, so <laughs> thank you, Phyllis. Um, yeah, I've been, uh, dos I started here when I was doing research for the Belle of Oyster Bay. It's an 18th century novel, so I needed to know what an 18th century home looked like. So I came here to the homestead to uh, take a look at the house, and the executive director we had at the time, Dan O'Neill, was so good that when I came here, he did the tour with me, and he toured me through the house, and by the time I left, I was a volunteer. So <laughs> I've been here since 2017, and I have loved every minute of it. So, But you're not here to find out about that. You want to know about writing fiction, and um, as you can see, that's what I do. So I have a contemporary series that I'm working on right now, because I kind of need a break sometimes from history. Um, but I am working on, um, I'm starting the idea for a new book that will take place during the Salem witch trials. But what I want to do, what you can do with historical fiction that you kind of can't do sometimes with contemporary, is take today's issues and problems and put them in a, a, a historical time period and, and get a message across that way that you wouldn't be able to do in a contemporary, because the more things change, the more they stay the same, really. So that's why a lot of people choose to write historical fiction, so that they can get that message out in a way that people will accept it. But let's start with what fiction is. <clears throat> Fiction as a noun is literature in the form of prose, especially short stories or novels, and they describe imaginary events and people. Um, you might hear the term novel or stories or creative writing, imaginative writing, works of the imagination, prose literature, narration, storytelling, romance, fable. It's all fiction. Um, I would just put it under that one umbrella. Um, there are two, uh, we, I call them the forks in the road. There are two kinds of, of fiction, um, of genres of fiction. Uh, one is commercial fiction. That's your Tom Clancy or your John Grisham or Danielle Steele or whatever. And then there's literary fiction, and those would be more lofty books like um, Brooklyn by Colm Toybin or The Road by Cormac McCarthy, I think his name is, the slower paced, more internally driven kind of stories that they don't have a whole lot of action. They deal more with relationships or um, personal growth or things like that um, from, the, the, um, from the protagonist. Um, here's a fun fact. Uh, you've all heard of Pulp Fiction. In fact, there's even a movie called Pulp Fiction. But Pulp Fiction actually comes from uh, a term that originated from the magazines of the first half of the 20th century. They were printed on cheap or pulp paper, and that's how they got the term Pulp Fiction. Um, and they published, they were stories of fantastic escapist fiction, um, general entertainment for the mass audiences. Think of the stories where the, the heroine is tied to the railroad tracks, and the guy's got to jump in and rescue her just as the train zooms by, that's your pulp fiction. Um, and this can be fun to read, but I'll get that page turned. Um, there are genres and then there are subgenres in fiction. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, when you think of genre, most people think if I'm going to walk into a bookstore, where do I find the book I want to read and what shelf and in what 
area of the store. That's what we think of generally when we think of fiction. You go in, you know you want to read a historical, so you go to that historical genre section and you find the book you want. Um, genre, subgenres can be um, within those um, categories further down. Uh, say, for instance, you're looking for an action adventure story. Um, there are, in the writing world, genre goes a little bit deeper than just where you're going to find it in the bookstore. What you're going to look for in when you're writing genre, the things you need to think about are controlling ideas of the story, uh, the core emotion you want the reader to feel. Um, the ob Believe it or not, genres have obligatory scenes and conventions. And if you're writing, say, an action adventure story and you don't have the right conventions in there, your readers are going to go, this isn't what I wanted. I didn't this isn't the book I wanted to buy. So you have to be sure when you're writing in a genre that you know what you need to, to meet the reader's expectations. You need to know what they are. So um, for instance, an action adventure, you want to write a book that's person against nature, like Jurassic Park is a good example of that. Um, action duels, person against person. Um, such as Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid or A Fistful of Dollars, those kind of books. Action epics, A Person Against the State, Star Wars, The Born Identity, those kind of books. Um, action Against, uh, The Action Clock, Person Against Time, uh, like Ransom, The Andromeda Strain, or this fun one, Back to the Future. Most people don't think of that. Um, <clears throat> so for historical fiction, you're comprising narratives that take place from the past, and you characterize them chiefly by an imaginative reconstruction of historic events and personages. Um, you can, that means, in plain language, you can have a fictional character and put them in an actual time and place and put them up against characters like, say, George Washington or um, Abraham Lincoln. Um, or you can have an actual person from a time period and make them into a, a character. They were actual people who lived, but you're making, giving them a character, and then you're presenting their life and their time period and how they would have moved through, how you imagine they would have moved through that lifestyle. Um, fiction can come in many different forms of, of length. So if you're writing a novella, which we call a short novel, you want to look at maybe keep your word count between 17,500 to 50,000 words. That could sound daunting to somebody who doesn't write, but like a friend of mine once said to me, a thousand words a day in 90 days you have a novel. So that breaks it down for you, makes it a lot easier. Young adult books, if you want to write a young adult, 50,000 to 80,000 words. Romance novels, 50,000 to 100,000 words. These are what they call industry standards. So if you are taking your manuscript and you're handing it to a publisher and you're saying, I wrote a romance novel, they're going to want to know how many, word, how many words are in that novel. And if you say, uh, I wrote a romance novel and it's 150,000 words, they're going to tell you cut 50. Cut 75, because you've gone over the length that they want to publish. Um, historical novels, generally 80 to 120,000 words. And why is that? Because you have to do something called world building. You have to create the place where they live, and your reader has to believe that that's where they are. So it takes a little more time and words to do that. So that's why a historical novel will generally give you a better leeway when you're writing. Um, a full-length manuscript, until you write the end at the end, you are not writing a book, you are writing a manuscript. And we also call them a work in progress or a whip. If somebody asks you about your whip, that's what they mean, it's a work in progress. Uh, your full-length manuscript is not a book until it is published. Uh, you can use the terminology interchangeably when you're talking with your friends, when you're talking with your writing partner or your critique partners, but no deep down that your manuscript is a manuscript until it has a book cover and you're, you're selling it. Um, it's a rookie mistake. We all make it. Don't worry about it. Um, you can change or be against or editor specific. Oh, I'm sorry. This may change or be agent or editor specific if stated otherwise, but manuscripts are always 
you have a trinity. They are always in Times New Roman or Arial font. They are 12 point type and they are double spaced. Otherwise, they'll just send it back to you and say, no, this isn't what we want. They won't tell you that. They won't tell you what's wrong. So you need to kind of glean. So knowing some of the industry standards before you send out your manuscript is always a huge idea. Um, you want one inch margins. You don't want extra spaces between paragraphs. These all seem like silly things, but they're things you need to know. Uh, single space between sentences after periods. Those of us who grew up learning how to type on a typewriter, no more period, double, double. No, it's period, space, and then move on. And they will ding you for that, believe it or not. They will send it back. Um, indent new paragraphs in each new section of dialogue with the exception of your opening paragraph that is always flush. Um, and then, uh, or your scene break. At the beginning of a chapter or the beginning of a scene, it's always flush. After that, you indent. Indicate your scene breaks by inserting either a blank line, a single centered hashtag, or a triple hashtag. Um, but that's, um, that's just tunes in the reader that, okay, we're making a break here and it's time to move on to another one. I usually use the single hashtag. I think it's messy to do more than that, but that's me. So whatever you choose to do. Begin new chapters on new pages and center the chapter title, even if it's only chapter one or you write chapter one using the number. Go down about a third of the page. Um, this is a formatting step that usually in later stages of editing and formatting, but most writers expect a new scene or chapter to beginning, begin at the top of the page when it's still a whip. So you have to remember to move it down. Format the header to include your last name and the title of the book. Um, uh, the page number that you're on, that's very important because if something, a page gets out of order and you haven't numbered them, it's murder to try to figure out where it's gotta go. Um, and then also, your title, your last name, the word count, the genre, if you're sending it to an editor or an agent, that's what they wanna see so they know what they're, and then make sure you include the page number. So that's just the, um, nuts and bolts. So let me give you some quick and dirty uh, little writer vocab and um, see how you do with it. <laughs> craft. When we talk about craft, that's the technical aspect of writing. That is the um, knowing um, how to set up, how to format, how to uh, write a chapter, um, editing craft, uh, writing craft, whether it's a protagonist, antagonist, you know, it's kind of the jargon um, and also the how-to of writing a book. Your voice, that's the author's style and it's as unique as your DNA. Um, the voice of, and I used to get this a lot when I would send my manuscripts out to um, editors or out to contests, they would come back and they would say, I can't hear the writer's voice. And I was like, this is the hardest thing to learn. And I was like, I don't know what that means. And luckily one time I was in a writer's group and I got that kind of feedback back from a contest and I said to my writer's group, okay, I've had it up to the eyeballs. What does it mean when they say you don't have a voice? And one of the people said, oh, that's easy. I can fix that. I ran through that all the time. I've learned what it means. And she taught me how to write. My characters will speak, your characters will speak in a specific way and that is their voice. That's what you have given them to write, to, to, to say. And you're, when your readers are reading them, they will recognize them instantly. That's what they mean by a voice. A beginner is someone new to learning the craft of fiction and or the publishing industry. It's not an assignment of quality or status. It is simply, I'm starting out. Reader tension, that's something that is hard to do until you learn your voice. And then you can learn how to ramp up your tension or slow it down as you need. It's also called pacing sometimes. They'll talk, talk about pacing. Um, but your reader tension is how fast do you want, you, you know, you, are you with Tom Clancy where you want your readers just flipping the page as fast as they can to get to the next thing? Or do you want a slow, leisurely, Howard's End kind of read where you're just going to the next and, go, and just enjoying and relaxing as you're reading your book? That's reader tension. GMC, or goal, motivation, and conflict. Good scenes 
and novels are filled with goal motivation and conflict. What that means is your character has to have a goal. They need a motivation to get that goal and you have to do everything in your power to throw conflict in their way so they can't achieve it. So it sounds counterintuitive, but that's actually how novels work. <laughs> so pacing, like I said, do you want a fast page turner or do you want maybe a slow, enjoyable read or do you want something in the middle? Um, pacing, if somebody, if you've written a manuscript and somebody says to you it was really good here but I really kind of was like bogged down here, then you have a pacing problem that you've slowed your book down too much and or you've added too many things at the same time and your characters literally don't know what to do. That's a pacing problem. And that's easily fixed. It's easily edited out. Um, you just have to recognize that that's where you are and then fix it. Sounds easy to say, but once you get going and actually writing a lot, you'll recognize it instantly and you'll know what to do. Um, weasel words and pet words. I'm big on those. That just fairly seems, thinks, looks, could, should, <laughs> those are mine. Um, and when you're writing, you're gonna have your own words. Fairly is a word that I use a lot. I don't know why that is. Um, but you have these specific words that come to your mind and you use them a lot. Some people use words like, that have a lot of S's to them. Other people use like short snappy, but the same words over and over again. Um, and those are weasel words. You wanna go through your manuscript and once you recognize what they are, circle them so you can remove them or use your um, search and find in Microsoft, type that word in. Read the sentence first because sometimes you need that word, but most of the time you don't and you can easily bring down your word count by getting, out, <laughs> getting those words out of your manuscript. Um, a contrivance is considered a deadly sin in the writing world. This is when you've written your character into a corner and you don't know how to get them out. So you give them a gun that has not been in the book before and you shoot people and then you can move on to your story. Your readers are gonna go, if they read that, I'm, that was like, no way. And we've all, read, we've all read stories or seen movies where we went, no way. That, no, that should not have happened. Then you recognize that that was a contrivance and it's lazy writing to f not figure out a better way to do that. Um, and then word count, we talked about that a little bit and that's pretty much how we measure everything. Your progress, your story form, your genre expectations. It is literally the number of words it takes to tell your story. So let's talk about the journey as fulfilling and necessary as completing of a manuscript is and releasing it out into the world, it, the journey from here to published novel, published novelist has two things, high points and low points. Your high points are gonna be your first three chapters. You get those done and you're gonna feel like you're on top of the world. I wrote three chapters. I finally did it, yes. I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, connecting with other writers and finding your community and your tribe. It is very important. I can't stress enough how important it is to have a writing network. People who you can give your pages to in a safe place, not your family, not your friends, your writing partners, your critique partners. You hand over your, your pages to them and you know it's a safe space. They're gonna read what you wrote and they're gonna come back and they're gonna have questions they're gonna have comments, they're gonna have suggestions, but all of them should be um, couched in loving terms and they know because they know how scary it is to give that stuff to someone too. They have to do it too. Um, and they're gonna say things like, I don't understand why you're doing, why your character is doing this or I like that but I didn't like this, or you know, they'll point things out to you that you sh you probably weren't even aware of, but that you need to be aware of. And so, your writing partners and your critique partners are very helpful. A little rule of, of thumb, though: if one person says I didn't like X Y Z, then you can take their opinion into account. But if nobody else says that, then that's their opinion. But if that person and that person and that person said, I don't understand why, then you have a problem and you need to fix it. Um, so just something to keep in mind.
The euphoria of typing the end at the end of your manuscript. The first, first full novel I wrote was in 1993. And it took place here in Burlington, Vermont. I was watching the news story one day, and they were talking about how they were replacing oil gas tanks from a gas station on the corner of North Avenue, which I don't think the gas station's even there anymore. But they were replacing the gas tanks, and they came across this pile of bones. So they had to call the police, and they came. And they were able, the medical coroner showed up, and they were able to deduce that those bones were more than 200 years old. So where did they come from? Well, from there, I was fascinated. When the War of 1812 was happening, there was an encampment here in Burlington where Battery Park is now. That was an encampment. They had disease that went through that camp. And any Civil War historian will know about disease in the early times of the wars. The same thing, smallpox or something, I don't know what it was, but it went running through that camp and people were dying so fast that they were just digging holes and throwing the bodies into pits and then burying them and they were forgotten. So there was an idea for a novel. And I wrote this book in 1993. The best thing I ever did was write the end. But the book wasn't, I didn't write it for publication. I wrote it simply for the the whole idea was to prove to myself that I could write a full book. And it never went anywhere. It went into my drawer and stayed. In fact, I think it's still there. I have no intention of publishing it. That was my proof that I could do this. So, and if that's what you have to do, do it. It's really helpful. So your first proposal from a, or a request from an agent or an editor, that's an exciting thing. Um, that means that, oh my gosh, I'm so close. I can do this, I can do this. Um, your first rejection letter, believe it or not, celebrate them. Because that means that they were actually intrigued enough to read enough of your book to know whether or not it was gonna work. The frustrating thing about rejection letters is they don't actually tell you specifically what's wrong. They'll just say, well, it's not right for us, or you know, maybe next time, or you know, something, and, and you have to kind of read between the lines to figure it out. That's really frustrating. Um, but a good editor or a good publisher, if you get that letter, and you reach out to them and you say, well, you said it's not right for you, this for me, or for you this time. Can you tell me specifically what I need to work on? 99% of the time, they will write you a very detailed letter of what they saw that they wanted to see fixed. But they haven't got the time or the resources to do that because they get thousands of manuscripts a month that they have to weed through. So if you reach out to them and you ask them, they will tell you. And I didn't know that when I first started writing and I would just get so frustrated. But I finally figured it out and did that. And I got a very nice letter back saying what I needed to work on. And that was so helpful. So rejoice in your re rejection letters and reach out and find out why they rejected it. They'll tell you. Um, when you receive that call, Hello, we would love to publish your book. We enjoyed it ever so much. That's do your happy dance, jump up and down, scream, holler, do whatever you have to do. Take yourself out to dinner, whatever, and then get back to your computer, start writing. The hardest part of writing a book is not actually the writing process, it's the editing process. It's the rewrite. Stephen King says it all the time. I can write anything I wanna write, the hard part is rewriting. So, because then you have to do what's called killing your darlings. You get attached to certain things that you've written and you really like it, but it doesn't serve the story and you kind of know it doesn't serve the story, but you don't want to get rid of it because you liked it so much. That's a darling, kill it. Get it out of your book, it doesn't need to be there. The low points, self-doubt a la mode. That is me. I feel like an imposter every time I write a book. Like, that was just a fluke. That was the Bell of Oyster Bay. It was terrible because No Safe Haven did pretty well. And then I was like, I can't do this again. I can't, I can't read, I can't, a lightning struck. That's not gonna happen again. I can't do this. So I really struggled with self-doubt and the imposter syndrome. Writer's block, to me, that's an excuse not to write. That's your brain telling you you're stuck. You don't have an idea. You don't know what you're doing. You, you really can't. Tell writer's block to go sit in the corner until you get your thousand words in, and then you two can have a conversation, but not until. Um, realizing your masterpiece isn't just yet. 
but it will be. Feedback that wounds, and you will get feedback that wounds. Basically, take your ego out of your story. It is hard to do, and we all add it in there. We don't even know we're doing it, but take your ego, put it in the corner with writer's block. When you get feedback that wounds, be hurt, feel it, and then go back and go, okay, well, what are they really saying? And is it valid? And should I be listening to that? And do I really have an issue that I need to fix? And then fix it if you do. And if you don't, be like, okay, well, that was that person and fine, move on. Um, having to answer no for the millionth time to the question from your friends and family, have you gotten your book published yet? <laughs> no. <laughs> Losing all your work. I'm ashamed to say, <laughs> losing all your work because you did not bother to do a backup and your computer goes blue screen and everything and you are maybe three chapters from the end and poof, it is gone. That is a definite low point. Back up your work. There are programs out there now that you can get like Scrivener that is a wonderful program. It backs up every time you close, it does a backup. It will back up every 10 or 15 minutes, however you want. So even if like last year I had to replace my laptop, I went out and I bought a laptop and I went, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna have Scrivener on here. But I downloaded it from the program, or from the company and I had my, my key, my manufacturer's key and I loaded that in and I went in there and there was my book. And I was like, oh. <laughs> God, it was that book, and I was three chapters from the end, so yeah. Scrivener is a good one to have. Um, and one-star reviews and reader rants. Don't pay any attention to them. One-star reviews, those are, I've decided, one-star reviewers and reader rants are people who wish they had the guts to write a book but don't, and they want to pretend like they're an expert, so don't even pay attention to them. Um, spend a few minutes considering two adages I want to give you. The first is, finishing your manuscript will be the hardest thing you ever do. And the second is, a finished manuscript is the easiest part of getting published. Um, and if you think new writers are, um, you have an idea if you're a new writer. I was talking to this lady, she's got a book that she wants to write about a character, a, a woman, an actual historical figure, right? Um, and she's read other books about this woman. So she could easily say to herself, well, you know, people have already read, written about her. What would I have to say? But think of Asha Dornfest, who said, I think new writers are too worried that it's all been said before. It has been, but not by you. So write it. Character plot and setting. These are three things that are very important to every story. It may sound like, and I may be, you might be sitting here going, why are you telling us this? Of course we know all this stuff. It does seem intuitive, but you also need to understand that a lot of people don't understand. <laughs> so um, these are things that you need to think about when you're writing um, your book. Characters. From concept to creation to maturity, your characters drive the story. They drive the plot within the setting of the story. So if somebody comes up to you and says, well, is your story character driven or plot driven? The answer is yes, because you can't have a plot without a character, and you can't have a character without a plot. So it doesn't matter if your story is plot-driven or character-driven. The answer is yes. It's both. Some writers build character sketches and assemble their hero, heroine, and villain, etc., from a box of character traits like a Mr. Potato Head. And if that works for you, fantastic, do it. Other models, others model them after a real person they know. Some people do a hybrid. Um, I use a program called 16 Personalities, and it's 16personalities.com. It's the online version of the Myers-Briggs tests. And I use onestopforwriters.com. So what I do is I go on to 16 Personalities, and I find, okay, this is kind of the type of person I want to write about. These are the personality styles I need to look at. And then I go to One Stop for Writers, and in there they have backstory that you can fill in, 
um, siblings, family structure, where they are in the birth order, what their dreams are, what, a, what traumatic event might have occurred to them as a child or a young adult or these sort of things, and you build a deeper person from that program. I have found using One Stop for Writers for the character things, uh, it, it's been essential for me because I tend to, character development for me has been a very hard thing to learn how to do. And my characters tend to be inconsistent because I don't write to a, I don't write to an outline. I'm what they call a pantser. So I just kind of let the story evolve as I write it. But that means my characters evolve as I write them. So when they started out this way and they end up that way, that's a character inconsistency, and it gets me every time. One stop for writers, once I've built that character, I can go back and reference it. Oh, yeah, they would not do that. Or they would do that. Okay. And I can write it that way. So it keeps my characters consistent, and it's really been a huge, a huge gain for me. Um, so... You have, three, you have two kinds of characters, actually. You have your protagonist, and you have an antagonist. And these days, with gaming getting so popular, they're also starting to call protagonists and antagonists avatars, which can be confusing. But that's the new term, so I'm going to throw it out there for you. Um, your protagonist or your avatar protagonist is your hero or your anti-hero. He is the main character. He or she is the main character of your story. Your antagonist is the villain or the person who's throwing obstacles in your protagonist's way to keep them from getting that goal or that motivation, whatever it is that they want to achieve at the end of the story, it's the antagonist's job to see that they don't get it. So those are the two major characters. You have minor characters also that are filtered in because nobody lives in a vacuum. They all have friends and family and things like that. And they can also be people who are preventing your protagonist from getting where, to where they want to go. Or they can be called what is called helpers or hindrances. So they can hinder the, the main character and stop them, or they can be their helpers and help them get what their allies and help them get to where they need to go. Um, your character should be as dynamic and complex and as rounded as possible. You don't want descriptors for your characters to be, you don't want people to say, this character bored the crap out of me. Nothing, they didn't react to anything. They're flat. They're static. They don't, you don't want that. You want like, oh my gosh, I just loved it when this happened and she blew a gasket. That was so cool. That's what you want your readers to, to feel when you're doing your characters. And if they're like, meh, then you need to go back and work on your characterization. But beware of stereotypes. We all write them and we don't even realize we're doing it. And you can, sometimes it's okay to have a stereotypical character if that's your intention. If you want that character to show a certain um, attitude that maybe we don't want to reflect anymore and you want that character to kind of really point that out, that's okay. But if you're going to go with the dumb jock or the vain cheerleader or the religious zealot, the bad boy biker, the town gossip, the rock star, the rich socialite, the clumsy waiter, or the noisy neighbor have a specific reason for doing it. If you don't, it's a stereotype. It's what they call a trope, and you want to get it out of your book. Um, and the question people would say, well, aren't stereotypes bad? They can be, like I just said. But you have to be very careful and intentional and respectful when you use them. Um, particularly when one is of a religious, ethnic, or other community group, either collectively or as an individual. Wherever you are on the spectrum between the thought police and the overdue reform, as an author and individual, be wary of the way and the manner in which you choose or choose not to include a diverse cast. When in doubt, stick to the wisdom of the adage, write what you know. And if that person happens to be stereotypical, write it. But... Um, what defines your character and how does the reader get to know them? Through appearance, mannerisms, habits, speech. Think of a caricature artist that pulls out specific features on your face and then kind of exaggerates them. That's what you're looking for when you're writing a mannerism, certain characters. I have the character in my contemporary. She's she likes to be honest, but she doesn't like to hurt people's feelings, so she'll always preface what she's going to say when she thinks it's going to be hurtful with, can I ask a question or can I tell you something? That's a mannerism. Um, how, to, how to imply that to your story? 
Here's a couple of examples I wanted to give you. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal. Thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just didn't hold with such nonsense. That tells you a lot about the Dursleys. They are the muggles muggle. Uh, they don't hold with nonsense. They like everything to be prim and proper. And you, you get all that just by reading that little blurb. Uh, here's another one. The school gymnasium was so loud that Fern had to lean down next to Bailey's ear and shout to be heard. Bailey was more than capable of maneuvering his wheelchair through the teeming student body, but Fern pushed him so they could more easily stay together. So that tells you two things about Bailey and Fern. Bailey is very self-sufficient. He can do these things, but Fern is very caring and wants to help him, whether he needs it or not. She's also kind of pushy, because she knows he doesn't need it, but she's going to do it anyway. Um, plot, that's something that you need to know about. <laughs> Every story has a plot. It's, got, it's, it's going from A to Z through your story. Um, the definition from the dictionary, plot is a work of fiction as, as its storyline, the ordered number and sequence of events that make up the story. The story's climax or turning point is a crisis moment of high tension and emotion in which the main characters solve the conflict and learn important things about themselves, other people, and the world. The definition from the editor's, the editor's blog, courtesy of the editor's blog, a simple de definition of plot is that it's the storyline of your novel. Plot is what the, is the what of the story. Plot might, out of necessity, include who and when and where, but it's the story events that truly um, define the plot. It can be a one-liner. A guy has to prove he didn't kill his wife. Or plot can be that rambling explanation, that 20-minute explanation when you're trying to tell your best friend about that great movie you saw last night. How do you make a plot? There are lots of ways. If you're what they call a plotter, J.K. Rowling is a perfect example of that. She plotted out every single book, all seven of them, before she even began writing book one. Um, you can do that. Or you can be what you call a pantser. That's me. A pantser is somebody who has kind of a general idea of how they want the story to start, how they want the story to end, maybe something that goes on in the middle, and you can write to the middle and then figure out the rest as you go. That's me. That's one reason why my characters are never really, <laughs> they tend to be inconsistent, because I, my story evolves, my characters evolve, and it's a mess. Um, you can be somewhere in between. You can plot and then write, you know, to and pants it as you write. Um, I've tried to do that, but usually when I end up going back to my plot to see where I am, I've already written like five pages or 500 pages ahead of that. So then I'm like, okay, that doesn't work for me, and I just keep going. Um, but if whatever works for you, whatever is comfortable for you, that's what you should be doing. Setting is where the story takes place and much more than that. It is the time, it is the locale, the weather, believe it or not, can be a setting. Objects, the era, the time period, the culture, the geography, those all make up your, your settings. So the who, the what, where, and when of a story is your setting. Don't let your story take place in a white room. And if a reader reads it and they say, well, I couldn't really see what was going on or I kind of felt like everything was white, you don't have your setting down. You need to work on that. It can be something as simple as, um, two people are walking around, are talking, and one goes over and moves the book from this end to that end. That's a setting. But you gave your character something to do that your reader could see. So you want them to be able to visualize the scene in their head as they're reading it. And if they can't, then you, you have problems with your setting. Weather is one I tend to forget a lot, and most writers do. It's just not something we think about when we're writing. And in my, one of my contemporary romances, I had a traumatic scene, where a scene where this woman had to confess a traumatic event that happened to her. And as I wrote it the first time, it was really kind of white roomy, so I rewrote it, and I put them on the street, and I, made, I had cars going by and this and that. It was okay, but as I was going through and editing that section again, there was a thunderstorm I could hear approaching us. So I wrote in the thunderstorm and just made that scene come alive. So don't be afraid to use the weather. It's a great way to get your setting firmly in hand. Culture, 
a lot of people don't think about that either. It's the laws, the social practices, the societal taboos, the societal expectations, politics and government, entertainment and games, religious practices, education, war, mores, and technology. And if you're writing a historical fiction, that is absolutely important. You need to have the culture of the time in there. And don't be afraid to immerse yourself into that time period and have your 21st century readers go, but that's not the way it is. Well, you're right. Today, it's not the way it is, but then it was. And I have to write to that, not to your expectations. So make sure that you know what your culture is and immerse yourself in it. And if that means you have to read a whole lot of nonfiction to get there, read it. Point of view, there are three kinds of ways you can write a book, and they call it POV, or point of view. There's first person, in which we use the I or the we. Think Katniss Everdeen in The Hunger Games. She wrote that book in first person. Um, second person is you. Almost nobody re writes in second person point of view. It's not a popular way to go. There's only one book that I've ever heard referenced, and that's Bright Lights and Big City by Jay McInerney. He's the only one that I know of that most experts know of who wrote in the second person point of view. And then there's third person, he, she, they, uh, that point of view. Um, and if, um, so first person is like someone is telling you their own personal story. Second person is the you. You walked into a store, you bought a bag, a bag of potato chips, you went home and watched TV. I would not want to read that kind of book. Most people don't. That's why a lot of people, nobody really writes in that point of view. Um, third person narrator can be highly subjective, and that's okay. So you have to decide which point of view um, that you want to write in. Now, if you want to go into deep point of view, Changing it from a third person to a first person does not necessarily give you a deep point of view, just so you know that. A lot of people make that mistake. Uh, but whichever is most natural for you, that's the best for the story. It becomes about perspective and about how you would experience the story through your point of view character or characters. So first person point of view has the least amount of narrative distance. You are that character. Um, and they live within the, you live within the character and the character relates all their thoughts and experiences. The drawback to this is, and it's actually not a drawback, it's a, it's a good thing, you can't head hop if you are the main character. Um, and by head hopping we mean by jumping into another person's point of view. Third person limited is the he, she, and this is the most common for commercial fiction because most people are used to it and they, and they understand it. So a lot of people write this way. Um, it remains limited to what that character knows and experiences. And they, again, you, can't, you, you shouldn't be head hopping. You can't head hop into another point of view. And you have to establish in every scene and chapter who the point of view character is if there's more than one character in your story. So for instance, in The Bell of Oyster Bay, I have two main characters, Sally and John. And this is ultimately a failed love story. They do fall in love with each other, but they don't end up together. Spoiler alert. But there's a lot of good stuff in here. So if you decide to buy it, please, the homestead benefits from it. So, But I wanted to read you a couple of th points of view, one from Sally, one from John, so you can understand how you would start a chapter with a new point of view. So this is from Sally's point of view. Saddlebags overflowing with Osnaburg linen, sugar cones, tea, and a choir of paper, Sally Townsend set off for Daniel and Susanna Young's farm on Cove Road. Such a beautiful morning with a hint of building summer heat. The salty ocean breeze rustled through the trees and blew soft on her brow, teasing her hair. She lifted her face to the sun as she swayed to the movement of farmer girl beneath her. Chores waited for her at home, but she rode at a slow and steady pace, enjoying her rare solitude. So that tells you a few things about Sally um, and that you know that that chapter is going to be in her point of view. So we're going to go to John, and this is in chapter two. If Lucifer claimed a home, Captain John Graves Simcoe was positive Staten Island was the place. Surrounded by water, the saturated air suffocated like steaming wet wool. Not only stifling during the day and cold and foggy at night, but the place stank from Manhattan City's rubbish. He couldn't decide which reeked worse, the pigs rooting in the refuse or the constant stench from the heap called Pig Hill. So you know that you're going to be talking about John. You know that he hates Staten Island, and apparently that hasn't changed in 200 years. Um, and that Manhattan 
dumped all their rubbish on Staten Island, and it stank constantly. And when I wrote that, and I was in a, a writer's group, I wrote that, and one woman in my group wrote back to me, she goes, OMG, I grew up on Staten Island, and it's still that way, and it still stinks, and it's still hot and sticky. <laughs> so I was like, oh, OK, I did that right. Um, we also know about Sally. She doesn't get much solitude. She loves to ride her horse. She loves being outdoors. She goes on these um, delivery journeys for her father just to get out of the house and get away from the chores for a while. So we've learned some things about characterization through point of view. Um, third person omniscient, that is, think Jane Austen, where you can hear everybody's point of view. You can hear what everybody's thinking. This was more popular in the late 19th, well, early 19th to the early 20th century. This was generally the way books were written. The author was allowed to bounce from point of view to point of view from any character within the scene what we call head hopping, to capture the inner thoughts of all the characters as they happened. There is a narrator present who functions like God and can tell us everything about every character present. In fact, they do call it the God mode. Um, so for instance, like I said in the Hunger Games, uh, listen to what um, Suzanne Collins writes. It's this detail, the untucked blouse forming a ducktail that brings me back to myself. Prim, the strangled cry comes out of my throat and my muscles begin to move again. Prim. I don't need to shove through the crowd. The other kids make way immediately, allowing me a straight path to the stage. I reach her just as she is about to mount the steps. With one sweep of my arm, I push her behind me. I volunteer, I gasp. I volunteer as tribute. So that's your first person. Second person, Bright Lights in Big City by Jay McInerney. You have friends who actually care about you and speak the language of the inner self. You have avoided them of late. Your soul is as disheveled as your apartment, and until you can clean it up a little, you don't want to invite anyone inside. And that's kind of an uncomfortable narration. And then third person, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone by J.K. Rowling. Something very painful was going on in Harry's mind. As Hagrid's story came to a close, he saw again the blinding flash of green light more clearly than he had ever remembered it before. And he remembered something else for the first time in his life, a high, cold, cruel laugh. Hagrid was watching him sadly. And you can hear that third person. Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen, The God Mode. Elizabeth, having rather expected to affront him, was amazed at his gallantry, but there was a mixture of sweetness and archness in her manner, which made it difficult for her to affront anybody, and Darcy had never been so bewitched as by any woman by any woman as he was by her. He really believed that it, were it not for the inferiority of her connections, he should be in some danger. So you heard from Elizabeth, and then you heard from Darcy. Um, point of view is technically the most difficult craft to, to learn and for to, to understand and then to master. Um, and I haven't yet encountered a writer for whom that wasn't true. Excuse me. But once you spend time with that concept and you learn how to deepen your point of view, you're going to find that your, your writing improves exponentially. As you're deepening your point of view, you're actually adding to your word count. And that's something like, hey, when I was learning how to do it, it was like, um, OK. Um, I'm actually writing more. I, I'm adding more, and I shouldn't be. And they were like, no, 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 that's what you want to do, because you're going to take it out in different places, so it's OK. My girlfriend, Nancy, she's my writing partner. She gave me these to, to go with. And I'll just do one, because I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, this is a good point of view. And this is from her book, Unseen Love. Um, and the character is Layla. And the first good point of view, father, Naomi is slave enough for our house, and we can hardly afford a second. Then her father slapped her hard enough she stumbled sideways. She hated him. That's pretty good. But we can make it better. Father, Naomi is slave enough for our house, and we can hardly afford a second. She tumbled sideways from the slap he gave her. She straightened, hoping the loathing in her heart didn't show on her face. It gives us a deeper sense. But the best, Father, Naomi is slave enough for our house, and we can hardly afford a second. Pain exploded along her jaw as she stumbled sideways. She straightened, fighting the urge to rub the ache in her lip. For the thousandth time, she wished her father was dead. And that's so much stronger. Um, so work on your point of view. If you don't get that, you need to get back to work. So. 
And you can think of it as the glass is half full or the glass is half empty, or maybe it just needs resizing. Um, traditional publishing versus indie publishing. I don't have a whole lot of time to go into that, but it's something to think about. Just know that um, there was a time when you could go to any publishing company. There were thousands of them. The big five is now down to the big three. They merge constantly, and they drop authors, and they pick up authors. They get hundreds of thousands of submissions every year, and because there are so few of them now, they only publish maybe three to five books a year. So your odds of being published by a traditional publisher are almost non-existent. So you can try it. And I have heard of people who, I'm very jealous of the people who write, I just wrote my first novel and I got a three book contract. And I'm like, I freaking hate you. Because <laughs> um, I tried for years to get published. Indie publishing, there are two kinds. There's indie where you do it yourself. You load it up to Amazon. I recommend Ingram Spark. Um, and you, but you are in charge of all the expenses for the book cover design and the marketing and the uploading and making your website and doing all of that stuff, you are responsible for it all. Or you can go hybrid, where they'll do all that stuff for you, but you're still responsible for paying for it all. You're also responsible for your marketing, and all they do is give you a published by XYZ publishing company. And if that's what you're looking for, fantastic, do it. If it's not, then go indie. I, I recommend it because you are more in control. But copyright your work. Go to copyrights.gov and get a copyright for your book because there are any number of pirates out there who will take your novel, if they can, and publish it as their, as their own. And then you're wondering where all your royalties went when they're going to someone else. But if you have that copyright, they can't do that. So, um, okay, so I just did the quick traditional roadmap. First thing you have to do, though, is finish the manuscript. You can't talk to a publishing traditional publisher company because they're going to say, send me your whip, and you'll be like, oh, um, it's not complete. Is that a, yes, that's a problem. Thank you very much. And you've just lost your chance. So make sure it's completed. Same thing with indie or hybrid publishing. If you want to go that route, make sure your, your manuscript is complete. If you're going to indie publish, find an editor. It's like doctors can't work on themselves, lawyers can't be their best clients, writers can't be their best editors. You can edit, there are some great editing books out there and I recommend a few like um, self-editing for, independent, for um, independent authors, I think that's what it's called. Um, let me see if I can find that real quick. Um, <laughs> I've lost it. Um, self-editing, oh, self-editing for fiction writers. How to edit yourself into print by Brown and King. That is an excellent book on learning how to, to, to edit yourself. And it's something you should know as a writer anyway. <coughs> but then, once you've done that and your book is done and you think you're ready to publish it, find an editor that you have to pay for because they are going to go through that book with a fine tooth comb and they're gonna get it back to you and you're gonna go, oh, it wasn't as good as I thought it was. Everybody goes through that because we can't see what, you know, after a while, it's like I used to have a boss that used to say, a sign on the wall becomes the wall. You can't see it after a while, so you need somebody who can and will point out to you the things you need to fix. So that's my, um, my advice to you. And if you want some of these, um, uh, craft um, book recommendations. I'm happy. I, I've got them all, <laughs> and I'm happy to share with you what they are. Um, a website is also important to have. Wix.com. That's where my website is. AngelaIMoody.com. It's very easy to set up. You need four things: an about you, um, a bookstore page where people can order your book. Um, a little blurb on a page that's a blurb on you and um, how to contact you so that they can ask you questions about your book or whatever. So um, I know I talked about fiction in general, but fiction in general is also historical fiction. And um, those are just some of the things. And if you have questions, I'm going to be hanging out here. Please feel free 
to contact me. Um, and also, if you just want me to get a, take a look at your maybe your first three chapters or something, I'm happy to do that too. And you can talk to me about that after. So thank you, Angie, for having me here. I hope you enjoyed that. Okay. Okay. Um, so we are going to do uh, Q and A time. Um, so stay up here. Okay. Now. But I also um, want to make sure that we have a moment to thank our sponsors for this program. Um, so we have some community businesses who help sponsor our um, enrichment program here at the Homestead, and they include this season uh, M and Bank, North Country Federal Credit Union, and AARP Vermont. Mm. And so, yay, thank you to those sponsors. Um, and also, we partner with Town Meeting TV, also known as CCTV. So um, those of you in the room can see Bella in the back. And Town Meeting TV records this program so it can reach larger audiences through our YouTube page, and they air it on the local television station as well. Um, so af and after the q and I am going to announce our um, upcoming <coughs> programs. Uh, so... If you, after the Q&A, just stick around for one more minute after that. But okay. starting with some questions, um, before I ask the audience for questions, I have a question. Okay. So I'm going to start with that. Um, so with historical fiction, can you speak a little bit about the how do you balance like historical fact oh, with, with your story. telling the story? Yeah. Okay. This is this is an issue I have all the time, and my daughter will read my my manuscripts and she'll hand it back to me and she'll say, "Tell the story, mom, not the history." It's really easy to get caught up in, oh my gosh, I didn't know that, and then you want to put it in your book. Um, you start with reading a lot of nonfiction. Pick the time period you want to write in, start reading nonfiction, learn what you can about that time period, and then find books that were written in that time period, so contemporary authors to that time, to get the flavor of the language. Um, you don't want to write like them because your readers today won't understand what you're talking about, but you want it to sound like it's that time period. But then don't get caught up in the things that you learn that about a historical time period that you put in the book because you think it's great. The readers aren't going to care. So <laughs> that's why it's like always, I'm always being told, tell the story, not the history. Um, so that's, I hope that's, but that's what you want to do. You want to start out reading everything you can get. So like the Salem Witch Trials, I'm reading right now a book called The Witches. Tom and out there, he's got a whole, sent me an entire list of books that he thinks that I should read and I'll get to them eventually. Um, and then I'm going to go looking for contemporary uh, works in that time period so that I can hear the language and understand and get the way that they would have spoken and the words they would have used things like that. It also helps you to understand how they they thought about things, the references that they make, and the mores, and the social cultures, and stuff like that. You learn, you find yourself absorbing it, and you don't really even realize it. How many years of research goes into one of these books for you? It's hard to say. Each book took me eight years to write. Um, because, well, for one thing, No Safe Haven was one of my favorite topics of the Civil War. I've always been fascinated by the Civil War. I can't tell you why, but that time period has always fascinated me. So the more I learned, the more I wanted to learn, and I couldn't quite stop doing the research and do the writing. I had to force myself to do that. Um, the Belle of Oyster Bay is the American Revolution time period. I knew much less about that than I did about the Civil War. So it, both books took me the same amount of time because I had to read a lot to absorb information I didn't have versus reading to get the information I knew but loved. So it, it's there's no hard and fast rule to how long it takes you. Some people I know can write a historical and just write the story and then go back and do the, the homework. I'm not sure I could do that. I'm going to try that this time around, but I'm not sure that's going to work for me. It's a new experiment. We'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens. Thank you. Sure. Questions from anyone here? Yeah. How much does time period um, reflect on dialogue? Like how people speak? So if you're writing a book on the late 19th century, you don't want to use terms that you would hear in the 21st century. So you're not going to use, you're not going to have somebody say, you know, if it's a 19th century character, they're not going to be like, hey, dude, you know. Right, well, I knew that. 
But I mean, how much of the dialogue of that time do you need to use? You don't need a whole lot. Um, you can, uh, Outlander is a very good example if you've read Outlander. Um, they use, every once in a while, she'll sprinkle in some Scottish words, right. but not a lot because she wants, she doesn't want to get bogged down in that. Yeah. So, you know, they might say, I can something. Right. Um, and I, yeah. Yeah. So. I can that. I can that. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but for the most part, the characters speak, you know, pretty normally. Um, in No Safe Haven, um, they used a lot of different, um, well, it was a very religious time period, too, far more than we have now. So there are a lot of religious um, references in that book. But that's how they spoke to each other, and people understood that language. And if I didn't put it in there, it would not have been authentic. So that's kind of, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. So anybody else have? Yeah. So um, I'm not a writer, um, so I'll okay. that, you know, listening to your creative process is so intense and, and deep. I, I find it hard to believe that chat GPT is really going to be a, a threat in this world, and yet everybody, oh. everybody's totally up in arms about it, screenwriters. I mean, do you think, what's your reaction to that? I'm a little afraid of it, be honest with you, because it's not, so what it does, from my, my basic understanding of chat GPT is it takes writings from everything, Shakespeare, and the Wall Street Journal, and yesterday's novel, and you know whatever, and it pulls all them together and it spits something out. Yeah, so you run the chance of, if you're gonna rely on GPT to write your book, you run the chance of plagiarizing, that's my point of view. Um, but also, you gotta wonder if it's stealing your stuff, which is why I say copyright. Copyright everything. Because my feeling is, my fear is, these AI programs are going to end up stealing your words. Um, I, I guess I was questioning more, it's really, it's, it's ability to create a voice. I mean, I, I understand that it's coming, you know, it's drawing from all sorts of things, but you're not going to get that kind of nuance. Yeah, that like, yes. Do you know? Do you, um, is your question kind of like, do you think publishers are going to start... I guess it's just hi using chat GPT instead of hiring. You'd have to have people to read right? Yeah. Be able to mm. discuss the, the different publishers. Yeah. yeah. Public. I, I, don't know, I don't know if the reading public will be able to discern the difference, and that's the scary thing. Because, well, in fact, I've been asked to judge a contest, and one of the things that was in there was, you know, AI is, you know, we need to be careful about AI. And I wrote back and said, I would love to judge, but how am I going to know? if AI has been used in the story. And they said, don't worry, we have ways of scrubbing. OK. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll do it then. Yeah. yeah. I've tried using it, and what I've gotten back is just regurg regurgitated facts that don't sound personalized. Right. Or well, then they're, they're, they're saying, well, the whole idea is then you have a basis you can start from. And you can, I like the whole process of using my brain. Mm. and not using a computer. And this is the other thing that we have to worry about. How, how dumbing down are we for our children that we're not even letting them think? So, you know. I've also heard the theory that, like, AI is going to be so prolifically spitting stuff out that it's going to just start copying itself. Like, mm -hmm. it's going to flood the market with its own stuff, so then it's going to become more and more gibberish. Like when you make a copy right. of a copy of a copy of a copy. Right. So <laughs> this is from someone who is saying that we shouldn't be that concerned because it's there. There'll be a time where it could get yeah. in the way, but then it's going to start becoming more and more gibberish. Yeah, but they'll but fix that. That's the, that's my that's my um, fear. They'll fix it as they go along because they don't want people thinking. That's my that's my. Um, Odyssey 2001 <laughs> Space Odyssey thing is that they don't want people thinking for themselves and so they're going to spit this stuff out that they want you to think and so you know Hal is alive and well <laughs> that's we'll a little see. scary well that's that's the future we're, right, gonna, right. we're, we're, we're in it today we're in a history medium so no. <laughs> um, does anyone have any other questions that they could ask Angela you'll be sticking around right mm -hmm. you, you have books here that you can Talk about, Absolutely. Talk, show people. Yeah, okay. you're certainly welcome to buy awesome. them. They're from the, well, the homestead anyway, and all, all proceeds go back to the homestead if you, you choose to buy a book. So thank you very much. Angela. You're welcome. So.
Thank you, thank you. Okay. I have just a couple of announcements about upcoming programs. Uh, so we do a monthly lecture every month. Um, and so next month is on September 17th, Sunday at 2 o'clock. And it is called The Capture and Rescue of Remember Baker. Um, Remember Baker was a cousin of Ethan Baker, who was um, active in the Revolutionary War and uh, was murdered. Was, was murdered the right word? Really? Beheaded. Yeah. But, uh, that sounds murdered to me. Yeah, murdered, but it's part of a military campaign. So killed in action. I'm not sure what the right terminology would be. It depends on which side you're on, too, in the war. Um, but the Green Mountain Boys certainly said murdered. Um, remember Baker was murdered. Um, early on in the war, and uh, Bob Tower from Bennington Historical Society is going to be here to talk about Remember Baker. And um, also coming up is, um, not until November, but it, I want to mention it now because it's a book club meeting, so we have a book club. Actually, Angela Moody is in charge of our book club, and uh, we just met in August. We meet four times a year, so the next time we're meeting is on November 5th at 3 p.m., um, that will be a virtual meeting, I believe. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, and because the museum um, will be closing at the end of October for the winter season. And the book we're reading is called My Bring Up. It's a memoir, and um, it's not too long. So um, it's really easy to read, and it's uh, really interesting. It's, it takes place in the mid-20th century here in Vermont, a native Vermonter growing up who also is a member of one of the Abenaki tribes here in Vermont. So it's a mixture of growing up in rural Vermont in the 1950s and 60s, um, as well as um, some of how uh, the, the politics in Vermont, particularly in the earlier 20th century, um, influenced their family's life as Abenaki peoples as well. So again, that book's called My Bring Up. We have a couple of copies available still in the gift shop, but it is out of print. So um, we also recommend people buy the Kindle version online uh, from Amazon as well. So those are the upcoming programs. Thanks once again to our sponsors, M&T Bank, North Country Federal Credit Union, and AARP Vermont, and our partner for this program, Town Meeting TV. Thanks, Bella, for filming it. Mm -hmm. And we hope to see you all here at the museum for another event. Thank you.